Okay, all that said, though, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Our passage today is verses 13 through 21. But the first word in my passage is therefore. Uh, my passage is all about the passage that just came before. Uh, in light of all of the things that we've read and that Cal taught yesterday, therefore, here's what we do. And so this morning, I want to have um, Tori read the scripture to us, and she's actually going to start way back in verse 3, refresh our minds in the truths that we've heard, and then we'll move on from there. All right, over to you, Tori. Tori is a school worship student. Yeah, my mic's up. Go for it. Um, oh, yeah, I'll be starting in verse 3. Sorry if I pronounce some words wrong, okay. <laughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by a various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look." Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy." And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or, or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown, foreknown before the foundations of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Wonderful. What a great scripture. Uh, Tori's on the School of Worship this year, and I, I just love it when Tori reads scripture, so I asked her this morning. Uh, but yeah, I'm really excited to be going through uh, a book of the Bible again. I think it's a fantastic thing for us to do as a church. Uh, you know, it's so important that last time we did this, uh, the enemy sent a worldwide pandemic just to interrupt us as we went through the Gospel of Mark. But we're finally back to it. We're in uh, First Peter, and uh, I think that God has a lot of things to, to say to us here. You know, the reason Peter wrote this book um, it wasn't just because he felt like he should be in the Bible, like, well, I am the apostle Peter, so I should get a word in there. You know, it was because he was passionate for the churches that he was building, and he said, I want to write things to them that are going to strengthen them to help them live this life that they've been called to live. Uh, but the Holy Spirit, um, by his sovereignty, made sure that it ended up in the Bible because he was thinking about us. He knew that there was going to be a living light church in Kenosha in 2023, and they need to hear these words too. This is going to be life and strength to us. So uh, I'm believing that as we look uh, through this book week after week, that God is going to use it to do wonderful things amongst us and equip us for the things that he has for us to do. All of that said, uh, the central thrust of my passage this morning is, therefore, be holy. Therefore, be holy. So therefore, again, in light of all of the, the blessings that we've talked about and read about, the great mercy that we've received, the new birth, the living hope, the gift of faith, 
Uh, all of these things, the saints of the past long to look into these things. The angels peer down in amazement because of the privileges that we have in God. And so Peter said, after saying these things, he says, therefore, there's a logical response to these things. If we truly grasp a hold of everything that God's done, there's something we must do. And what Peter says is, therefore, be holy. What is the response to all these things? It's holiness. I need to live a holy life. If we're seeing our lives correctly, if we have in view the mercy of God, the natural response is holiness. So that's what we'll look at this morning. Now, some of you might feel like, did we not have a message on, on holiness somewhat recently? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> We've had quite a few actually over the, over the last year. Uh, and so as I was preparing this week, I was kind of doing some mental gymnastics and can I make this passage about something else than what it's pretty clearly about? Uh, but in the end, I couldn't get around it. This is what Peter is telling us to do. We need to live a, a holy life. And so in the end, I was encouraged by it because I do believe this is a timely word of God to us. This is something that he's speaking specifically to us. You know, it was always the word of God uh, to the people of God to be holy, but I do feel there's something, there's something timely in it for us to get a hold of in our lives in our day. And so we'll look at holiness. Um, now holiness is interesting because it, be, it can be difficult to define. And on one level, when I read these verses, I think, well, kind of thanks for nothing, Peter. You told us to be holy, but what, what is it? What does that look like? You know, it would have been helpful if after he said, be holy, he'd given us a list of do's and don'ts because now I know what I'm supposed to do. Or give me that 12-step plan and I'll, I'll go ahead and follow it. But Peter doesn't do that here. Uh, he seems determined not to boil holiness down in that way. Um, it's more than just rules to follow. Um, instead, he gives us the overall shape of holiness. It's a mindset. It's an attitude. It's a, a way of approaching life that we take on. And he paints a picture of the kind of life that, that, that this is. And this is important because if we don't have this, if all we have is the do's and don'ts, uh, we can never actually be holy. Even if we're following them quite well, we still won't attain holiness. You know, Philip brought this out great uh, a couple months ago when he's saying he grew up in a holiness movement uh, and he did quite well following the rules, but all he came out of it with, with was the rules. Just do this and do that. And he missed the heart of holiness. Uh, and we need that. We need the heart. We need it to grip us if we're truly going to be a holy people. It's kind of like this. It's kind of if, if you said to me, okay, tell me what Living Light Church is all about. And I said, well, we have two services. There's one at 8.30. There's one at 10.30. And uh, it's important to try and be on time. Amen. And that's what I told you about the church. It's not that those things aren't true, right? But I've kind of missed the point. I've kind of missed the point. No, tell me what your church is about. And it's like that with holiness. If we just jump to the do this and, and don't do that and miss the heart behind it, then we haven't really got holiness at all. This isn't to say that Christianity is a religion that doesn't get into the specifics or leaves morality up to us. It doesn't say just make sure your heart is in the right place and then define holiness for yourself. Uh, no, in fact, the New Testament gets very specific one of the ways that it does this is through virtue lists and vice lists. It's just one of the ways that it does it. So in the New Testament, there are 15 virtue lists, 15 lists of things that we do, and 19 vice lists, things that Christians don't do. There are 159 total items on those vice lists. Uh, and top of the list is sexual immorality, idolatry, and the ways that we speak. Okay, so the Bible gets plenty specific. Uh, but that's not what Peter is doing here. He's trying to paint a picture for us. He's saying this is the kind of person uh, that a holy person is. So with that in mind, let's dive in and see what Peter says. Does that sound good? Okay, first thing that Peter says here, or first thing that I'm going to draw out, is that holiness is a thankful response to God. Or a holy life is a life lived in thankful response. The first of all, holiness is a response of gratefulness for all that God is, has done. Again, this is the big therefore at the beginning of our passage. We've just heard about our inheritance, our salvation, the mercy, the protection of God, and then the therefore, right? These things should produce a thankfulness in us, a sense of privilege, a sense of who am I to receive all of these things? But it shouldn't just produce a thankfulness. It should go on to launch us into a whole new kind of life. This is the flow of our Christian lives, is that in the morning, we reset our minds with all of the great things that God has done, 
and then therefore, now I'm gonna walk out of my room and live a certain way because of everything that God has done for me. In other words, it says, how could I not spend my energy in service to God? If I've truly seen the things that he's done for me, how could I not spend this whole day living my life back to him? And at the end of the day, when my energy is spent, I don't think about the fact that I did a good job. I don't think about myself at all. I'm just still thinking, who am I to receive these great things from God? In other words, for holiness to be holiness, you don't just do holy things, but you do them gladly. You do them freely. You do them because you've caught a vision of how good God has been to you. This is the point of being born again. You know, born again implies the start of a whole new life, doesn't it? The point of being born again isn't just that you're glad that you got born again. It's not like a trophy that you put on the shelf and say, I got born again, this is great. But no, we're born again into a life. We have a whole new life that we can live now um, because of what God has done. You know, it makes me think about my, my boys. I have three boys and I remember uh, each of them being born. I remember my firstborn Jed the most clearly because uh, he wasn't breathing when he, um, when he was born. And uh, which I had no idea. I mean, obviously that's not ideal, but I didn't know that's kind of fairly normal for babies and you kind of have to get them going. Um, no one had told me that. So he came out, he wasn't breathing, and it was an intense moment in my life. <laughs> um, and he didn't breathe for just, it was just about 10 or 20 seconds. I have no idea actually how long it was because uh, it felt like three hours to me, you know. But when he finally got going and gave that first cry, it's one of the very few moments in my life where I just buckled to the ground because of just the, you know, the, the awesomeness of that moment of having a new life. But you know what I didn't do in that moment was say, okay, I really, I feel like I've experienced fatherhood now. I'm good, right? Because the point isn't the moment of birth. The point is he has a life to live now. I want to train him. I want him to grow up, right? That's what it's all about. And it's the same for us with new birth. We don't just say, well, praise God that that happened. But we say, there's a whole life for me to live now as a result of these things. So every morning to be holy, we say, man, I've been given a new life in God, we turn back to 1 Peter, or 1 Peter. <laughs> See, when I get going, I forget. I'm still working on it. Uh, but we turn to these kind of passages and we remind ourselves, this is what God has done. Therefore, now I'm living my life for God. You know, for me, a lot of times, I just can't get past Psalm 23. Just the first verse, the Lord is my shepherd. You know, so often I wake up in the morning, the anxieties can start right away, the, the stress, the things of the day. And I just think, I have a shepherd. I'm not here on my own, I have a shepherd. You know, there's these truths that we just remind ourselves of. Now I can live my life back to God. Peter returns to this theme in verse 18 and 19. He says, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious love of Christ, precious blood of Christ, sorry. So what Peter is saying here is your new life didn't come cheaply, right? It's not a light thing that you're saved. Jesus bought it by his own blood. And again, when we see this, we think, how could I not live my life back to God? Peter also says in verse 17, and if you call on him, as father who judges impartially according to each man's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. So there's a, there's a flip side to this. It's not just the grace, the mercy, the goodness of God that causes us to respond to him. It's also knowing that he's a judge. It's also knowing that we'll stand before him uh, at the end. Um, and so we have we have this big picture of God. He's not small in our thinking now. He's big, he's everything. And when we see him for who he is, it causes us to live in this kind of way, this holy way. I wanna to turn to Leviticus 19, which uh, is often called the holiness code. Uh, this is gonna give us plenty of specifics. If you want specifics, Leviticus 19 is a great place to turn. Uh, but I just want us to see what God says over and over again uh, about our motivation for holiness. So starting in verse one, it says, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to all the congregation of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall revere his father and, mo and mother and you shall keep my Sabbaths. Why? I am the Lord your God. 
Do not turn to idols or make for yourself gods of any cast metal. Again, why? I am the Lord your God. Jump it down to verse 11. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among the people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why? I am the Lord. And it goes on, but what it's saying here is there's a certain life that we live that is the only way to live once we've caught a sight of God. Once we're seeing him in all his greatness, his majesty, his great mercy, his compassion, but also his awesome fearfulness, it produces a, life, a certain lifestyle of response in us. So holiness is a life lived back in thankful response to God. Second thing here is that holiness is a hope-filled perspective. We live our lives full of hope. We already heard about that this morning, didn't we? It's time and you guys listen, it is time for a hope reset. Holiness is a way of life that is naturally produced when we are saturated with hope. So Peter said, we have this glorious hope, he described it to us, but then he said, listen, set your minds on the hope to be revealed. Set your minds on it. It's not enough just to have the hope. We all have it, but we gotta understand it, and we gotta set our minds on it. Once we start, start to do that, we're gonna naturally make decisions, we're gonna naturally live in a kind of way that we would call holy. Again, it's not enough to ha simply have the hope, we gotta think about it every day. We gotta reset ourselves in hope every day. If we have a clear vision of this hope, it will lead us into action. Let me give you a, an illustration of this here. Let's say that, let's say that you had a conviction uh, to pray. Let's say that you, you decided, man, I wanna pray more with my spouse, with my family. We're gonna start to pray every night. Um, we, wanna, we wanna establish this as a, as a rhythm in our family. And let's say that you spend a few nights praying together. But one day you had a busy day at work, you come home, um, you're tired from the day, now you're putting the kids to bed, all of that. Once they're in bed, you think, man, I'm, I'm just kind of exhausted. You think, you know what? I am so tired. I know we said we pray, but let's just go to bed. Uh, and that would sound pretty reasonable, right? Uh, but let's say that right in that moment, I came to your house, I knocked on your door and I said, hey, I know this is, this is so random, but I had a vacation that I was gonna take. And uh, for one reason or another now, I can't, I can't go on this vacation. And so I don't want it to go to waste. I'm looking for someone uh, to go. How many of you would be interested in that? Now, what if I said, now here's the thing that was so last minute, the flight actually leaves in four hours. So if you wanna go on this thing, you gotta start packing right away. How many of you know you're all getting up? You're like, where's the suitcase? I gotta find, I gotta pack as quickly as possible. All of a sudden you have this energy you didn't realize you had, right? 20 seconds ago, you were like, I'm too tired to pray. Now you're like, let's get going. I do not wanna miss this flight. Why? It's because of hope. It's because you had something in your future now. I'm gonna aim for that and it unlocked this reservoir of energy that you didn't realize that you had. That is what hope does. That's why we have to fix our minds on the hope that we, that we have because when we do that, it's gonna propel us into a whole new life. We're gonna find that we're living our lives with an energy and a power that we didn't even know we had. Why is that? It's because we grabbed a hold of our hope. Again, Peter says, uh, prepare your minds for action. It's this kind of thing. Once we have hope, we're prepared for action. Why? Because I'm working towards something. Well, that literally means there, uh, what Peter said is to gird up the loins of your mind. I don't know if you realize that your mind had loins, but it does. <laughs> and we need to gird them up. 
<laughs> so the image here is of wearing some clothes that you can't really work in. And when it's time to get going, you kind of hitch them up and you get ready to, to be able to move. It's kind of like we could say, take off the high heels of your mind. They look fine, but you can't run a race in high heels. You gotta get your mind ready and going for action. How do you do that? You don't beat yourself into action. You remind yourself of the hope that you have. And all of a sudden, I'm ready to go. So what is our hope? It's a grand vision of what God is going to accomplish. It's sure. It's something we can be absolutely confident of because it's based on the resurrection of Jesus. This is what we sang about this morning, right? Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Every promise is absolutely sealed because your buried body began to breathe. Like once Jesus rose from the dead, it's over. There's no more questions. There's no doubt about how this thing is gonna end. Jesus defeated death. So we have this absolutely sure hope. Again, Cal brought this out last week. Normally when we use hope in everyday language, we just mean I wish. As in I hope that the weather is nice tomorrow. What we really mean, we're not confident. We just mean I wish. And I don't care how good your weather app is. It's just, it's just a wish that we have. Biblical hope is different. It's saying I'm confident. I know what's gonna happen in the future and I'm absolutely confident of it. Not just because God said it, but because Jesus rose from the dead. So again, biblical hope is different. It's absolute confidence. Going back to our illustration, if I came to your house and offered you this vacation, you might think, well, maybe this guy is just a compulsive liar and uh, playing a weird joke on me. But if I come to you with the tickets, I say, here's the plane tickets, here's the hotel reservation, it's absolutely certain. Okay, now I'm packing my bags. I've got the tickets. Well, we've got the tickets. Amen. We've got the tickets. There's nothing uh, left to question once Jesus rose from the dead. Again, Peter says this in verse 20 and 21. He says, Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So why did God do everything that he did through Jesus? It's so that we could have hope in him, so that we could live these lives of faith. So will it make a difference? Will it really make a difference if I pray? Is it really worth continuing to take a stand? Yes. Is the heartache of living this Christian life really worth it? The answer is always yes. Why not? Because I feel like it in a moment, but because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We live these lives of hope. We say, I'll contend for your promises. We have great promises from God. All right, I'm gonna contend for them. If God said it's gonna happen, then I know it's gonna happen. So I'm gonna be one who stands in faith and hope. So our hope is absolutely sure. Second thing is that our hope is restorational. It's not a hope of escape primarily, but a hope of restoration. It's not things are bad right now, but I'll hold on and one day I'll get to heaven. And oftentimes we've made our hope primarily about escaping to heaven. The Bible talks much more about heaven though as a kingdom being established right here on earth. This is how Jesus taught us to pray. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So I don't just hold on for heaven, but I grab a hold of it. I say, God, establish it down here and establish it now. This is what I wanna see. It says, if God's on the move, everything can change. So I'm launched into a life of mission. Don't help me escape up there. Help me to engage in bringing your kingdom down here. You know, being clear on this will totally change the way that our life functions. If we have a hope of escape, we'll primarily live lives of escape. It's like, let me escape to Netflix right now and then to heaven later on. But if we have a hope of restoration, we'll live lives of mission. God's restoring all things. I don't want to miss out on that. I don't want him to do it in the next generation. I want him to do it right now. So this is the kind of hope, so what can I do? I can live a life of holiness. That's one thing that I can do. So when we have this hope, we're launched back into this kind of life. You know, Cal mentioned a song last week that we're doing in the Benefit concert. I'm gonna mention another one uh, because it's just, it's so good and it, 
uh, really captures this kind of, this hope that we have in God. And so it's, did you feel the mountains tremble? Do you guys know that song? So good. Let me read out a couple of lyrics for you. This was written by Martin Smith. And I tell you, when he wrote this song, he just got a hold of some of the hope that we had. He just caught a vision of it. He said, do you feel the mountains tremble? Hope isn't just something that we know. It's something that we start to feel. We put our minds on it long enough that we feel it in our bones. Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one. Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar? When the lost began to sing of Jesus Christ, the saving one. That's my hope. I'm thinking about the lost people in my life. Man, I want them to rise and start to sing of Jesus Christ, the saving one. And we can see the God you're moving, a mighty river through the nations, and young and old will turn to Jesus. And then how do you not sing the next line? I don't know, but fling wide, you heavenly gates. We want heaven down here. Prepare the way of the risen one. Open the doors and let the music play. Let the streets resound with singing. Songs that bring you hope and songs that bring you joy. Dancers who dance upon injustice. Did he not catch hold of something here? Man, and I know what you're thinking. Why are you reading this out to us? Let's worship together. We'll just come to the benefit concert in six days time. We'll do it. We'll have a party. It makes me think of Jonah a little bit. You know, when God spoke to Jonah and said, go to Nineveh, Jonah said, I don't, want, I don't want to go. You know, I think if it was me, I would say, I don't want to go because I might preach the gospel and I'm not sure if people will really respond. Um, you know, it's such a hostile environment, these kind of things. But Jonah said, I don't want to go because I, I know if you're sending me and I actually preach the gospel, everything's going to change. Yeah. I got to learn something from that. You know what I'm saying? I got to learn, jo- Jonah saw something that I don't always see. Like, okay, if God called me to be alive in this generation and he's given me his gospel, something's going to start to happen when I engage in holiness. Something's going to start to happen when I live for God. This is the kind of hope that we have. It's a hope that God can restore everything. And so if we've lost this sense of hope, we need to urgently regain it. And it's an easy thing to do. We live in such a hopeless culture. So easy to fall into what difference would it make if I fill in the blank. So easy to be worn down and crushed by the things that happen to us. We need a hope reset. Do we not need a hope reset? I know I do. So my antidote is this, the Bible. (laughs) I just start to shut out other voices and I turn my ear back to God. I find the more that I'm in the word, the more hopeful that I am because I keep reading about these really dark situations, these really dark moments of history. And then I keep seeing God break through in his power. And I think, well, my day is no darker than this. And God hasn't changed. So maybe he can break in now. And when I start to read the Bible, I'm like, how could I be hopeless And how could I be apathetic? I'm going to live for God, a holy lifestyle with everything inside of me. All of a sudden, why couldn't God bring revival in our day? Come, Lord Jesus, probably in 50 years. No, come, Lord Jesus. Why couldn't you do it now? Why not? Well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm certainly going to pray. And I'm certainly going to live for God in holiness. Those are the things I can do, and I've caught a vision of something, so I'm going to do it. Okay, final thing here then is that holiness looks like a life on mission. We started to say these things, but uh, as we've seen, Christian holiness must be hopeful, and if it is a true biblical hope, it will thrust us into mission. So holiness then looks like mission. Again, holiness isn't a retreat. Uh, Holiness is an engagement with the world around us. And this is what verses 14 through 16 say. This is the centerpiece of our passage. It says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, 
So you be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So a couple things here. The opposite, Peter says, of holiness isn't wickedness, uh, isn't depravity. Here he says the, ignoran- uh, the, the opposite is ignorance. Uh, later on in verse 18, he says, you know that you were ransomed from your futile ways of life, handed down from your forefathers. So the opposite of holiness just looks like emptiness. It looks like futility. It looks like just nothing. It certainly did for me, you know, when I, uh, when I had a period in my life that I wasn't really living for God. I didn't, I didn't go out and do all the worst sins. I just, I did nothing, basically. You know, very, very quickly, my life emptied of all purpose. I don't have any idea of why I'm here anymore, so I guess I'll just uh, binge some TV. <laughs> And what happened, actually, what happened for me was, uh, so during this time, like I said, it was quite an inward thing. So I wasn't, uh, I was still part of a church. I was actually still on a worship team. All these things, it's in my teens years. And, um, and there was one particular day where m- me and my friendship group, we said, let's have, a, let's have a Disney day. We'll spend a day watching all the old Disney movies. Um, and so, so we decided to do that. So we started at 8 a.m. with The Little Mermaid. And uh, yeah, I know, it wasn't my choice, but... Um, but we got going, like, okay, we're going to do this day, let's do this thing. So we started, and uh, we kicked off with Little Mermaid. Uh, now, later that day, I couldn't stay the whole day because I had a worship practice that night. I was still on the worship team. Uh, and so I was watching these movies for, uh, you know, I don't know how long, an embarrassingly long amount of time. We didn't stop for lunch. We just grabbed some food and kept watching. And it was really, it was boring. I think we all felt like that, like, oh, it's going to be great. We'll watch these movies all day. But by the afternoon, we were like, this day's kind of dragging. <laughs> this is kind of boring. Anyway, I couldn't finish out the day because I had to go to this worship practice. And all of a sudden, I'm singing about God and who he is and what he's all about. And all of a sudden, I had this vision of two ways that my life could go. I was like, the rest of my day was pretty boring. But this is great. This, I'm catching a vision again. But this is what my life is all about. And that day I decided, Matt, I gotta give my life back to God. It was in, it was a, I remember it was sometime in November and I said, January 1st, I'm giving my life back to God. I don't know why I didn't do it just then. I guess I wasn't used to girding up the loins of my mind. But, um, but I said, okay, I'm gonna do it January 1st. But this was why, because I just saw, I'm not doing these horrendous things, but my life is just so empty. And I see that a life lived in holiness to God is so full of purpose. And so what is our mission? It's to image out God in a world that desperately needs him. Again, Peter said, as he who called you is holy, so you be holy. Since it is written, you shall be holy since I am holy. This gets to the heart of what holiness is. We get to know our God. We can't be like God if we don't know him. We get to know him and we start to look like him. And we start to look like him on the earth. And it starts to change everything. You know, this was our mission right from the beginning. God's plans never changed. When he created human beings, Genesis 1, 26, he said, let us make man in our image. Okay, I'm gonna make an earth and then I'm gonna make humans to fill it with the image of me. Obviously that went wrong, didn't it? But it just makes it all the more important that we do now. You know, the earth looks nothing like the image of God anymore, does it? That's why we're now exiles in this earth. If we start to look like God, we we look like foreigners. We look like aliens, but what an exciting thing. I'm an exile in this world that desperately needs God, not only proclaiming God, but demonstrating him in the way that I live. I can't really think of anything more exciting than that. This is the same thing that God said to Israel when he formally established them as a nation. After he rescued them from Egypt, Um, they were in the wilderness together and he established his covenant with them. So Exodus 19 verses five and six say this. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So what is he saying here? He's saying that you're my priests. That means you have a special close relationship with me, special access to me. You're gonna be my treasured possession. And what I want you to do is obey my commands. I want you to start to live this holy life, but why? God says, because all the earth is mine. He still has his eyes on the ends of the earth. And he says, if these people will start to live like priests, if they'll start to do this, 
It's a plan that's going to stretch out right to the ends of the earth. And so this is why we turn away from our old lives. Why? Because they just look like the world because they're completely futile. But if I have the new life of Christ, I can start to fulfill my mission. You know, I just want to say one thing. If there's any teenagers in the room, I remember being a a teenager and I remember that above everything, I just wanted to fit in. That my, my main motivation in life is how can I look like the people who I'm around. Um, and you know, it kind of took till I get to my 20s that I realized I'm, I'm not cool. I'm just not. There's no point, no point trying to, I'm just gonna embrace it. Um, but at the time, it was quite a strong drive to want to fit in. Uh, and I just wanna say that when we live for God, we, we don't get to do that anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry if that's bad news for you, but you can't do it. Uh, you have to live for God and part of it, it's inherent in our Christian lives is I'm gonna stand out like a beacon of light. I'm gonna look different to everyone around me. This is the message of the New Testament. Ephesians 5 verses one and two says, therefore be imitators of God. What do we do? How do we love, live our lives? We find out what God is like and we imitate him. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So however Jesus lived, however he did it, all right, that's my goalpost now. That's what I'm aiming for. So we've kind of already said this, but a couple of things about this this holiness then is it it must be relational. We can't look like God if we don't know God, so we've got to get to know him. It's also comprehensive. Peter says it's it's in our lifestyle. There's nothing that's outside of um, the realm of of what God um, wants to say to us. So Grace said, come and take your place right at the center of my life, right? That was the song for this morning. That's it. There's nothing in my life that God can't put his finger on and touch. It's not just enough to honor God with my prayer, with my Bible reading. It's got to be in my finances too, yeah? I got to do the Dave Ramsey course. (laughs) And last thing here is it's deliberate, It means that we can't say, yeah, I should really get around to making this change one day. It said, no, I'm gonna do something today. I'm gonna start to live like God. So here, it is time for a hope reset, isn't it? Um, Shannon, would you mind getting on the keys? We'll just take a couple of minutes here and just stand in the presence of God. You know, hope is something that we, that we work on, something that we live out. But I believe that God uh, can do something right in this moment as we just stand in his presence. So let's stand together. Thank you, God. Yeah, if you speak in tongues, just begin to, to sing out in tongues. If you don't, just sing the name of Jesus. Spirit, I pray that you would breathe fresh life into us. God, for those who've been worn down by the challenges of life, we need your breath of life. We need your fire in our veins, God. Holy Spirit, we're asking for you to come right now. Fill your people. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your hope, God. Thank you that you are the God of all hope. Thank you that we have a living hope. Thank you that we have a sure hope. I believe that as we're fixing our eyes on him, some of you are beginning to feel strength in your bones. You're actually starting to feel it. I felt so weak. Now I feel it in my body. The enemy's told me you're not good enough for this. You're not strong enough for this. God is saying, yes, you are because of the hope that I have for you. 
as you start to feel that strength rise up in you, just lift your voice. Let it be an expression of the hope that you have. Let's sing to God together. Thank you, Father. some people here who you've lost some hope and it's because of your track record you're saying I've tried this before the least significant thing about your life is your track record I believe the Lord would say the least significant thing about your life is your track record I've washed you clean by the precious blood of Christ. And I am strengthening you to live a new life in me. The one option you don't have is to give up your hope. I took away that option when I rose from the grave. So God, we just lift up before you our track records. We submit them to you. And God, we say, let today be a fresh start. Let today be a fresh start. Would you empower us by your spirit to live sober, self-controlled lives, set on the hope that you have for us and ready in position to live for you, God, to live for you with everything inside of us. Thank you that your grace and your mercy is so abundant to us. And God, we just determined today to live our lives back to you. God. Yeah, it's time for a hope reset. Thank you for resetting our hope this morning, God. Thank you for your great and powerful voice to us. God, we just say that now we will stand in hope. If I have to reset my hope in an hour's time, I'm going to do it. If I have to reset my hope tomorrow morning, and I know I will, I'm going to do it. I'm going to remind myself of everything that you've spoken. I'm going to reset my hope, and I'm going to live for you, God. Amen. Amen. Good stuff. God is on the move. Let's be hopeful and let's live for him.